on. Um, and yeah, I just want to reiterate that the organisers have done a really incredible job. Um, so well done to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that the term decolonisation has really become a massive buzzword in the student anti-racist movement. And um, I think we've spent a lot of time defending this term in public um, and things done in the name of this term, but we've not really spent much time actually engaging within ourselves and amongst ourselves in unpacking what this mean, what this word means to us. And I think what concerns me is that sometimes, um, you know, we confuse or we think that in order to be a kind of open and inclusive movement that we somehow don't have to be rigorous or have definitions or kind of put red lines around this term. Um, so I think for me, I'm going to start off by just kind of briefly outlining the two things that I think have to underpin any kind of understanding of decolonization um, in the context that we're working. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the struggle around the statue and some of the things that I learned um, while being in the Rose Moss School movement. So the first thing that I think un has to underpin any use of this word is this understanding that coloniality, fighting it rec and reckoning with it, um, is at the heart of what we do and that we understand that within that when we're talking about racialized inequality or any of these kind of things that we discuss that the colonial relation is at the heart of it and that's in the term you know it's decolonization and that's why i think as much as the term might be used and abused by university bureaucrats i think we shouldn't let go of that word because that in that centering of coloniality past and most importantly present um, is incredibly important and it helps us to understand the kind of structural change that we need to overcome um, the issues that we're talking about. Secondly, that decolonization has to be underpinned by a very live notion of being anti-colonial. Um, it's a, you know, colonialism is not just an issue of legacies. Um, we can't, you know, and yes, we're often dealing with legacies, but we can't afford to act as if all we're doing is reckoning with what happened in the past, with dead white men, with you know histories, with statues, um, from the you know rampant violence of the fossil fuel industry on indigenous communities to West Papua to Palestine. Colonialism is a very live and urgent reality. Um, my concern is that we're becoming very comfortable in the institution and too concerned with trying to get concessions from it. Some concessions are very important, of course, things like curricular transformation. Um, it's really important, but I worry in case we're forgetting why it's important. The university is not a front line of oppression. Um, it's a site of knowledge production and therefore a strategic place to organise. It's one site amongst many sites of resistance. And we, I think we should try and resist the exceptionalisation of the university as a place that should be uniquely safe and uniquely sort of free of oppression. Um, because it's not possible, and it also reinforces a lot of the like paradigms that the university uses to distance itself from the things that it's complicit with outside of the university. So in terms of the statue, um, and the, the things that I think we need to remember about the statue, is that the struggles around the statue were symbolic. Um, you know, the statue stands on one of the busiest high streets in Oxford, but it's out of plain sight. Much like, the, much like Empire, it occupies this position of simultaneous invisibility and visibility. It's always present. It's an always present shaping economic, political, and cultural force, but it goes unnamed, it goes unseen. And when it occasionally peeks into public eye, it feels like it's just a relic of an irrelevant past. But it came to being um, as a result of intense racial violence, and that violence is erased in its very form as a kind of glorifying tribute. Um, and that has consequences in the real world, um, in the same way that colonial violence and roads as wealth um, are decoupled in the statue, so is um, <coughs> coloniality and the making of the modern world. Um, things like the industrial tales of industrial revolutions are forcibly separated from you know, the colonial relations that made them possible. Um, and these violent racial <coughs> inequalities that ground our history and produce our present are blocked of, of a block to how, how we see the world around us. And you know, I wonder how differently public discourses around issues like immigration, borders, war, <coughs> colonialism, national identity, globalization, would be different if the racialized and class dynamics of colonialism were fully integrated into everyday historical reflections. 
So with this in mind, and the biggest lesson that I learned from being in the Rose Must Fall movement is that I want to implore against the politics that makes the claims around space on the basis of safety, on the idea that we need to remove these statues in order to create a safe space for students of colour. It's important that the university has a duty of care towards students, and particularly its most marginalised, but this can't just be about us. It's about something much bigger than us. And furthermore, when you frame the issue solely in these terms, yes, it has to be an element of the discussion, but when you frame it in these terms, you lose the integral notion that the statue is a symbol, it's a metaphor for wider historical, material, cultural, and economic processes. The statue is not the issue itself. Um, and this idea of it being a metaphor starts to get lost, and then we see the conversation get stripped of its core of political, social, and economic justice, and pushed into the realm of welfare and sort of administering bureaucratic solutions. Obviously, welfare and coloniality are very intrinsically connected, but it kind of gets pushed into this realm of like bureaucratic ideas of administering welfare. And that ultimately, whilst it's very media friendly, and the media very much likes to frame it as just, you know, students going through, just sort of as a, just a solely student issue, it will ultimately backfire on the core and long-term anti-racist aims. Thanks a lot to Dali. If you want to find Dali's excellent Twitter handle, it's uh, Dali and Gabriel. Um, we'll hand over to Dan Hicks, uh, who's Associate Professor at the School of Archaeology, a curator of archaeology at the Pitt Rivers Museum, and a fellow of St. Cross. Okay, thanks very much, Max. Um, it's excellent to be here. Um, I want to make a contribution as an anthropologist, and I want to make a contribution that is about not only those issues that we've heard about so far, which are obviously really important issues about everyday uh, racism, about the legacies of empire, but that extend that builds upon those to talk about knowledge. And I want to talk about knowledge through the lens of heritage. So the statue of Rhodes is an artefact which we, can, we understand as anthropologists in the same way as we understand those objects in the Pitt Rivers Museum and the built environment and the, the artefacts in any museum in any area of the UK um, or internationally. And, one of the risks when we start sort of talking about the past is that we think of heritage as, you know, Neil Asherton argues in the 1980s, heritage is right wing. Inherently, when we talk about heritage, when we talk about the material remains of the past, we risk uh, writing a certain narrative, uh, you know, you know, which is a reactionary one. That was the argument which was you know, put, that was the source of you know, the sort of social constructivist argument of the 1980s, which was put for all sorts of good, good you know, reasons from, from, from the position of a certain form of Marxism. But I think you know, today we have to see ways in which heritage isn't only right wing, the only, you know, where we can't, where we can't, you know, where, you know, where we have to do more than simply sort of critique. Uh, those narratives, we need to reimagine them as sites for new kinds of conversation. So my interest here is in the Rhodes statue, is in the Colterton Library, is in a series of other monuments, is in the Pitt Rivers Museum, as a location at which we can think in alternative <coughs> ways and in which we can start to undertake what Eduardo Viveros de Castro um, has called, if you like, the uh, the permanent, the the uh, the, uh, the permanent um, moving away from a colonial form of model uh, of, sort of uh, knowledge. So how do we How do we use these locations to provincialize Western thought? How do we think of them? in terms of not only spaces where we can rethink things sort of today, but actually to set the legacies of empire at the heart of how knowledge has been made in this institution over the past 400 years or so. So what that involves is a rethinking of the, uh, the crisis of 
a representation of anthropology which occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, which was a diversification of you know, many different voices and a loss of any authority to the anthropological knowledge. Instead, what we need to do is in many ways reimagine the discipline as a space in which we can reverse anthropology. We can understand that the material remains of the processes of empire are analytical resources. That the Enlightenment revolution, that the knowledge which was made in this institution, indeed in many ways in this college where we are uh, here today, which was the site of the first of the museums, uh, where many of the Pitt Rivers objects in the 18th century were originally housed. Um, how we think of them, how, how we think of them not as, as a marginal set of objects that we need to um, erase, but instead as the remnants of an unequal past which we have to foreground in the present in order to change knowledge. So, I guess in order to sum up what I'm interested in sort of contributing here, is a, is a request for us to think <coughs> how do these uh, debates work in a university in really extra, you know, distinctive ways as well as those ways they work more widely in the world. And for me, that is about thinking in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, the Germans have a wonderful phrase where they can talk about the sort of Denkmal, the which is a memorial to the past, but they also have this alternative phrase, the Mahnmal. And the Mahnmal is, is a monument to shame. It's a monument, it's a way in which one thinks about the, uh, the material remains of the Holocaust. This is a way of thinking that isn't only about remembering, but about reminding, about making a warning. And I think in many ways that, that for me is the challenge um, for an anthropologically informed account of how we think about Oxford's imperial past. Thanks to Dan. We'll now hand over to Michelle. Michelle Covington-Rogers is a teacher in Oxford, a trained unionist. Uh, she's been involved with the Rose Must Fall movement and a range of other political movements. Um, she's descended from one of the many people enslaved by Christopher Codrington. Uh, and Christopher Covington is, of course, uh, memorialised in All Souls College with the Covington Library. And we warmly welcome Michelle Thank to speak. You. Max also failed to announce that I'm also the least qualified member of this whole panel. I am not a historian. I literally scraped through my A-level history. So um, as a teacher, I am going to hold my hands up and admit that. So thank you, thank you, Max, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Um, and I still wonder how I end up on panels um, talking about the Codrington legacy in particular. Um, not just because I am not a historian, I'm not an academic, I'll hold my hands up and say that, and I feel I've snuck in through the back door, but I am here because of my name, and as someone who's obviously had this name since birth and is a proud part of the Codrington family from St Vincent, despite being the Barbados collars, I'm not from Barbados, <laughs> for those of you who um, I'm from, uh, my family are from St Vincent, um, it's a legacy that's always been there and it's something that I've known of in the abstract and it wasn't until I was young, probably about 10, 9 years old, I apologise for those of you who've heard this before, um, my father received a phone call and I heard my dad basically using a number of swear words and slamming the phone down. And as a child, you go and ask your, your parents, what was that about? And my dad was, oh, somebody has just phoned us up and asked us for a donation towards the Codrington legacy, towards keeping the library open. Um, to which my dad um, then proceeded to explain very briefly with quite a few swear words about how, where our name came from. And I think, um, going from what Dahlia has said, I think the important thing about decolonisation is reminding, remembering that so many of our children don't know what colonisation is and so it's very hard to teach them about the decolonisation if they don't know what it is and as a teacher that's one of the hardest things that I have is that even just through my name I am I, I when I stand up and I speak as a trade unionist or as a teacher my name does stand out because there are very few of us who um, who are able to kind of embody what this this name means and as I think after last year and the um, conference that was organised at All Souls, I learned more about the heritage of the Codrington name in that one day than I've ever learned. And 
and I was able to add in my family's uh, my family's oral history, and that's as as people from the Caribbean, our history is oral. And so talking about heritage, it's, it means so much more to us than an artifact because it's from that person helped your grandmother be born to that person once lent you a coconut when you were coming home from school to my grandmother remembering Dustin's slave journals when she was a young girl working in one of the, one of the homes on the plantation in, in St. Vincent. So I was able to finally bring this together with the oral history that my family have got. And I, I'm from Oxford. I, I'm born and raised in Oxford. I was born in the John Ratcliffe. I grew up in Jericho um, as a child who went to the local primary school, a very, very good multicultural primary school, as a girl who went on to an outstanding school that luckily I've gone back to. They had me back, despite being a bit of a troublemaker. Um, they had me back. But I've grown up in the shadow of the Codrington Library, and I am hand on heart saying I've never been in there. And even at the conference last year, where I, we were in a room practically next to it, I have never been in the Codrington Library. And for a number of reasons. The main reason is um, I wasn't sure where it was <laughs> for the longest time, didn't actually know where it physically was, knew it existed, but had never been in there. But also the fact that um, as an, as an Oxford-born and bred, I'm not an academic. I'm not from an academic family. Um, that door is closed to me. It, it, the university is not a place where I could feel that I could walk in and out of, unless I know someone who works here. And for most of us in Oxford, we know porters, we know the cleaners, we know the cooks, we know the people who are in the background of the university. That is our way into the university. And as a black woman, and I can't sit here and say I'm not acknowledged intersectionality, as a black woman, that door is doubly closed to me, as especially from someone who's working class. I'm proud to be working class. I'm proud to be socialist. I'm proud to be a trade unionist. I'm proud to be a teacher. I'm proud to be a mother. I'm proud to be so many things. But that pride didn't help me open that door to get into Oxford University, to go and see a place that has had an impact on my family's, my family's heritage, my family's story. But there's also that personal aspect of it as well. It is because of that, that family link uh, it's felt very difficult for me to go in there, to know that there is this space that is built on the back of, of my ancestors who were working for free and they were enslaved and they were helping contribute to a fortune that might not seem much by today's standards but by slaves who are not earning anything. That fortune is beyond money. And so I haven't been in yet and, they, and after the talk at um, All Souls I was invited in and I've had lots of people reach out to me from the Codrington Library saying we'd like you to come and visit and we'd like you to come and, and see and there's been an offer of a plaque being put up as well to not erase the history but to acknowledge the history, to think about the language um, which my family, I took back to them and said this is the word and they want to use, how can we make it better? And my family contributed to how that language can be changed. It's important that the people who are living the legacy, who are being affected by the legacy, have a voice in the current conversation. And the funniest moment, I think, of the All Souls Conference was um, so all of the academics stood up and was, well, we wouldn't even know where to find a descendant of the Codringtons now to help readdress this situation. And myself and Max kind of looked at each other and we kind of said, yeah, they either haven't read the information about who sat on the panel, or they haven't acknowledged that there are descendants who have grown up in the shadow of the university. So I just wanted to kind of finish off by, and I, I'm a teacher and I apologise, I do talk a lot. Um, the, the fact of the matter is I've kept my name and my name is my link to my past and to my family's history, history and our ancestry. And every time I do something, I feel I'm doing it, not just for myself, not just for my daughter who's sitting at the back playing on Minecraft, um, but I do it for the ancestors who are nameless, who might not be Codringtons, who might be um, one of the other names of people who were descendants of slaves. But I stand up and I use my name and I keep my name with pride. And the heritage that we have to hold on to is making sure that the next generation know this. British history is too focused on the World War II. They can't get past World War II. I don't understand why they, they just constantly look on World War II. And I think from what Dan has said, I think there's an element of shame there. I think there's an element of, we didn't quite win there, so let's focus on 1966 and the Second World War, because that's something that we can hold on to. 
And actually, we need to acknowledge that this history has created and impacted on our, on our current, on our, on our future. And our, the next generation need to know that. And so I opened the door to, open, to Oxford University, and I say, there are schools in Oxford who need to know what you guys know. Whether you are a first year student, whether you're a postgrad, or whether you're a professor, or whether you are at the top of your field, we need you to tell us. Stop talking to each other, okay? You can hold symposiums like this, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but we have got a whole generation coming up behind us who have no idea, and we need you guys to come out and talk to us. The trade union movement is here to help facilitate that. Teachers are here to help facilitate that. Schools are here to facilitate that. Don't wait for the people in charge to give you permission to do it. And that's me speaking as a trade unionist and a mum. Okay? You don't wait for get permission. Do it. Come and talk to us. We are here. Get the message out. We need to have this debate and this discussion with the students who have not got the opportunity to come in that door. So thank you very much. Michelle's humility, the, the speech that she gave at the Codrington Conference that I was at made a massive mark and opened a, a door to, to conversations uh, that will hopefully bear fruit. Um, yeah, we'll, see. Um, we'll now um, go on to Njodi, Njodi Dunyema. Uh, he is an info student in law at Linica. He's very involved with Roads Must Fall and also Redress Roads, which is um, a group of students uh, within the Roads Fellows community thinking about decolonisation. Uh, so, Njodi. Um, thank you very much, Max. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers for also inviting me. Um, I also feel as pleased like you, Michelle, because this is my first non-legal panel that I'm sitting on. <laughs> so, um, I hope I do not disappoint my invitation. Um, um, I will perhaps just like to share some of my experiences as a person who has been involved in uh, the Rose Must Fall movement uh, effectively since its inception, as well as someone who has been involved in Redress Roads, which is a smaller um, a unit w um, within the roads community effectively. Um, but I'll focus my comments on redress roads because I think much of the narrative about roads must fall um, is much more prevalently known and redress roads is uh, internally focused um, but I think uh, has quite a lot to offer in terms of how to take the decolonization project forward. Um, and I think um, I think a good starting point is philosophy and uh, the philosophy of the non. And this clarion call effectively to say that every generation must, um, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Um, and of course, he was speaking in generational terms, in terms of one generation, uh, a lifetime, and so forth. But I think we can also look at generationalism in terms of our, Oxford, our time in Oxford, whether you're a, a student here, um, for a semester abroad or a default. I think that in itself is a generation. Um, and I think taking that forward is exactly what uh, a movement such as Rose Must Fall and Redress Roads have recognized. Um, and I think um, there are a lot of learnings that uh, can be drawn from particularly Redress Roads because Redress Roads, unlike Roads Must Fall, was internally focused. So a group of scholars who are concerned with, who were concerned with uh, the legacy of the Rhodes Scholarship, the legacy of Rhodes the person, um, and of course in light of all the happenings at the time at UCT um, and uh, the creation of Rhodes Must Fall following the infamous uh, colonial comeback cocktail at the Oxford Union, um, sought to reflect much more critically um, and truthfully and accurately um, and, and ensuring that Rhodes House as a space was a less degrading um, institution for Rhodes scholars. Um, and because of our inherent linkage to the legacy of Rhodes, uh, not necessarily because we come from Southern Africa, <coughs> from Namibia, um, and of course, uh, you know, the wealth of Rhodes was accrued in uh, Southern Africa as a, through his pursuit of empire, but also because of our sheer association with the Rhodes Scholarship name, which we acknowledge um, is built upon a foundation of wealth which was nefariously acquired. Um, we saw it as uh, being incumbent upon us to critically engage with this uh, legacy in a much more structured way. Um, so um, I must acknowledge uh, from the get-go that um, four women of color were at the forefront of Redress Roads, um, and some of us were 
involved in both redress roads and roads must fall. And obviously, um, something that I think is worth reflecting on as uh, we consider how to take the decolonization uh, project forward is the question of methodology and modus operandi. How do we engage? Uh, what are the tools that we use to engage? And I think the contrast between roads must fall and redress roads is one that is helpful. Redress Roads took a deliberate uh, decision that as Rhodes Scholars, we have a space within Rhodes House. We are Rhodes Scholars and we're entitled to that space in as much as any other person is. So we occupy a unique position. We understand this, uh, this complex machine that is the Rhodes Scholarship that uh, you know, has uh, 5,000 Rhodes Scholars all over uh, the world, but of course concentrated in North America and the West uh, predominantly. Um, so we, as Rhodes Scholars, can actually contribute something in the short term, medium term, and long term. And the approach that uh, Regis Rhodes took, for example, was to identify particular things. We identified the toast, so there's this long uh, tradition whereby um, uh, Rhodes Scholars, uh, when they're coming to Oxford or leaving Oxford, would uh, raise their glass, glasses and uh, toast to the founder, um, as well as the queen and so forth. But, uh, you know, the founder was really... Uh, problematic um, because there was no critical engagement with the founder. So, irrespective of whether you came from Southern Africa or Zimbabwe, particularly, or, 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 or certain parts of South Africa, uh, you are toasting to a man because he effectively created a scholarship uh, that was meant to advance the ideas of imperialism uh, to effectively ensure that you do not occupy any significant position in society. Um, so uh, there was internal engagement, uh, Rhodes House was accommodating, it must be said, uh, and today the toast, for example, no longer exists. Now we toast to um, Aristotle, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so, so, so uh, we, we recognize that we occupy the unique position where we could uh, effect some uh, short-term change. But there are also much more substantive uh, issues to engage, particularly with the road scholarship, the allocation of scholarships, uh, the fact that they still uh, are distorted to people of privilege predominantly. There is a school scholarship mechanism, for example, in South Africa, where four scholarships go to previously and currently predominantly white male schools. Um, and how do we effect change there? There is a lot of uh, good will, um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm, there are a lot of road scholars who are pursuing this forward, but they certainly do need the support of scholars here in residence. Um, uh, and moving on, I think uh, Blue mentioned that I, I should touch on perhaps the, 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 the statement that we released in support of Tohoso Kwabe, uh, who was subjected to, to really vitriolic attacks because of his involvement in the Rose Must Fall movement and effectively calling uh, for for um, the removal of the statue and everything that uh, that represented. Um, and one of the issues that were, three of the issues that were addressed there were, was the question of hypocrisy, why we uh, as Rhodes Scholars uh, do not feel that uh, we are, are not are hypocrites for calling for the falling of the statue when we are, um, um, are beneficiaries of the Rhodes Scholarship, which I found to be a very basic point. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, we as Rhodes Scholars, particularly from Southern Africa, women Rhodes Scholars who were excluded until the 1970s from participating in this uh, opportunity, see it as a form of reparation um, and how to carry that for, uh, forward and also the importance of uh, intersectionality in our engagements, not just across the lens of, of race or of, uh, of, of gender, but also the other categories of, of of intersectionality that aren't as prominent, classism, ableism, and so forth. So, so those are the things that we really wanted to be conscious of. Um, perhaps I can just conclude with um, how, with reverting back to the theme, how to take the decolonization uh, project forward. And, um, I'm currently reading um, a book by uh, Justice Moseneke, who is a Robin Islander. Uh, he was here about uh, three weeks ago. And in his book, he's narrating a part where uh, they had agreed with his comrades to um, embark upon a hunger strike. So these are the Mandelas, the Kathradas, the Atoibos, and so forth. Um, and it was an 18-day uh, hunger strike uh, in order for the Robben Island um, uh, wardens to give in to, uh, to certain uh, privileges, such as get, getting books and playing sports, for example. Um, and then he, 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 he narrates how he walked into a block and um, a toilet block and he, 
he smelled the stench and was like, well, where's the stench coming from? If we're all on a hunger strike and we're only, only um, you know, feeding off water, why is this a stench? And he found one of his, one of his comrades there. Um, and of course, you know, that is a betrayal that has the potential to undermine the whole project. Um, but at the same time, they did subject him to, subject him to some form of disciplinary proceeding. Um, but I would best describe that process as one that was uh, strong and sympathetic. And I think that should encapsulate how you carry forward uh, the decolonization movement as people who already agree that decolonization needs to be done, deconstructed and destroyed effectively. Um, the generosity of spirit that, that you require. Um, and I think those are some of the learnings that we as people who have been involved in redress roads and more so roads must fall have taken away. Um, that we should not can, cannibalize our, upon ourselves. Certainly we should be vigorous and, and, and um, ventilating and debating in, in a concrete way, uh, but it shouldn't come at our expense. Um, and I think uh, we shouldn't allow the revolution to, to um, eat its own children. Thank you. <laughs> Much enjoyed it and that discussion of the position of road scholars and the road class leads us quite nicely to our next speaker, who will be Nadia. And so, Nadia Fugurua is the Dean of Scholarships and Director of Leadership and Change at the Roads Trust. She also heads the Character uh, Service and Leadership Program, which has had a range of other roles um, with the Government of Jamaica, the University of West Indies, and then in setting up a uh, public policy think tank in the Caribbean. So, we're very grateful to have her on today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, it's a brilliant job to the organizers in, in making this happen in the way that you've made it happen. Um, I'm actually going to start a bit with the personal. I'm going to take you through a little bit of an arc of my own kind of Oxford journey, um, which began as a Rhodes Scholar in 2007. And when I was contemplating, well, how do I come and speak about kind of taking the decolonization project forward, I tried to remind myself of how I felt the power dynamics when I first arrived here. And I was actually walking through Cowley, and I'll come back to why every weekend I need to spend time in Cowley. I have to take myself out of central Oxford and then be there for a moment. And three vignettes kind of came to me. Um, one was my second week of being here walking down High Street and seeing another black woman across the road. We literally crossed. She was on one side, I was on the other side, and we stood in the center and just like literally beheld each other hugged each other. Neither of us had phone numbers at the time, so we figured out, well, where are you living? Where are you living? And like literally two nights later, she was like at the front of my door. She's still one of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of one vignette. Another vignette was towards my second year here, wrapping up on the MPhil, trying to figure out if I was going to stay for the DPhil. And at the time, my, my long distance boyfriend from Jamaica came to visit. And he was very hard on me because he found Oxford to be such a lovely place and he didn't understand what I had been complaining about for two years. <laughs> um, we had saved up to go to one of these black tie events. I hadn't been to one thus far. And I wasn't sure if I was going to stare or not, so I said, well, let's do this. And um, he came up from the bathroom ashen-faced, you know, and he said, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you for being strong here. And I said, what happened? What happened? He was in the bathroom. I guess there wasn't a urinal available, so he was in one of the cubicles. And there were two young men outside, tipsy as people tend to do at black ties here in Oxford, and they were drinking from the tap. They didn't know he was there. One said to the other, oh, don't do that. That's something niggers do. So after having these glorious 10 days that he literally had saved for two years in order to be able to do, he, he heard this. And he, you know the complete about face of Alnadi, this underbelly of what it is for you to be here that I have not realized. I'm proud of you for standing here. The third vignette, um, and this is later now, this is in my DPhil years and, and working in a, in a college, I won't say which because I love the college and I love most of the people there, uh, but it's one of these dinners, again there's copious amounts of alcohol, flights of wine for every meal, it was a four course meal. Um, it was to the end of the fourth course, I was cold as I tend to be and so I had a fur shrug on, a fur shrug, and a Dom turned to me and he stroked it like this. And he said, my goodness, Nadia, you're always so well decked out. He's like, this fur, it's like stroking my pussy. Just like that. Just like that. So the political is always personal. And for me now, I inhabit an entirely different space because I am in a position of power at the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, but I had to take myself back to what was it like for you when you first got here, two years later, even three years later. Um, what does it mean to be a, a woman of color, a woman from a small island? 
um, inhabiting these very inequitable and oftentimes unjust power dynamics. And so what, what I want to pull on is actually provoke us a bit in how we look at kind of struggle for change and kind of change campaigning and some of the, the tensions that arise for me particularly in looking at the symbolic. And I feel like others have said, I'm not an expert on the symbolic, even though I study anthropology. I'm much more, it's a false banner, but I'm much more about what I call structural systemic change. But the two have to be integrated. So when I look at the symbolic, um, and when I look at the Rhodes Scholars who have been at the forefront of this, as Njoti just spoke to within the Rhodes Scholar community, but also more broadly, what are some of the things that are challenging? I think when we focus on things such as a statue, the name of a room, or a portrait, we tend to reduce. And it's not the intention to reduce in the way oftentimes that the campaign is set up, but media and also power dynamics would very much like to look at, well, it is just about the statue. Or it is just about the personality that is at the forefront of this calling for the changing or the removing of a statue. And so I think that's something that we have to pay attention to. And now in the role that I am in, I think very hard about, well, how do we create the kind of conversations in which we can move beyond what is easier to forefront, the symbolic, into the kind of the longer term progressive championing that's going to be required to get the shifting of the dynamics that we want to achieve. Um, and, and let me say a, a little bit more about that and actually touch on some of the things that Njoti has talked about. Um, these intangibles that make a place like Oxford, and it's not only Oxford, um, unwelcoming, uncomfortable, and sometimes hostile. You know, what is that? In that, in that first vignette I gave you, it was about the actual <coughs> numbers that are here. Are there people who, I'm not going to say look like you because it's not that simplistic, but who recognize you, who understand your person, your humanity? And what does it look like then to talk about shifting dynamics of admissions? What does it talk about to, to talk about shifting dynamics of faculty? So even though when we do get talented people, are there faculty here that can support them in the kind of themes and topics that they want to, to, to champion? And we see this from the road, the road Scholar side a lot because you have a brilliant MPhil scholar who has a distinction and would like to go on to do a DPhil, but they can't find the kind of supervision here. So they're easily taken off to other universities who are happily to fully fund them. So I think there again you see that the integration what's really going to be required to shift things forward. Um, the last thing I would like to say, because I'm going to keep my, my points short, is on how we frame the conversation around deco decolonization. And again, it's raising attention. I think we speak a lot about, or people put this language to it, we talk about restorative, we talk about reparations. These are very important conversations, but they also tend to drift us towards the past. I think it's very important to have a future onlook. So from an institutional point of view, what are the vision, what is the vision and what are the values about where it is we are trying to go? So this is not an affirmative conversation. It's not about there are not enough people like X, Y, and Z here, or there's not enough of this in the curricula, and it's a justice issue because there was injustice done in the past. For me, it's much more about what are we envisioning as the best possible institution that we can have in which our young people are practicing the kind of leadership that is going to go onward to change the world on the front lines of injustice as you were speaking today. In which case, we absolutely have to be able to open our doors to the most talented. And in order to do that, we have to be very realistic about well, what is the history of this institution. It was, a feeder, it was a feeder for schools of a very small subset and it is still set up as such. So if we're going to be realistic about shifting those dynamics, then I think the way in which we move from a conversation from about the symbolic into things that are much more systemic is something that we have to do with an urgency. And I wish that we were able to link more the urgency that came about from the conversations of kind of front line of the media or statue to the, okay, well, what does a pipeline initiative look like? What does it mean when we say, okay, well, maybe we need to go into high schools and prepare young people, bring them here for three consecutive summers because we realize that they have the capacity, but there's an unlevel play field in such a way that if we want to see them coming up to be undergraduates, to be graduates, to be faculty, then that's the kind of investment we have to make. And we're not doing that because we feel, oh, there's a historic injustice. We're doing that because we feel it will make the institution and the world that we want to see a better place. And I think that's the kind of conversation that we're definitely beginning to have within the Rhodes Trust when we talk about outreach, 
And when we talk about, well, are we preparing our young people who come from quote unquote less traditional backgrounds? Are we preparing them well enough to do an application that's going to get them into an Oxford course, to support them through that Oxford course? But of course, we are just one subset of a broader university structure. And it's very interesting having those conversations with the university structure where people are and where they're not. Thanks so much, Nadia. And our final speaker before we come to questions is Laura, um, Laura van Broekhoven, uh, who's the director of the Pitt Rivers Museum. And she's also a professorial fellow at Linnaker College, and she's been um, very engaged uh, in a range of conversations on decolonization since she came to Oxford. Thank you, Max. Um, that's a, um, extremely um, strong panel, I think, and um, I just want to pick up on some of the lines of conversation that we've been having, both yesterday and during the keynote um, of uh, Carmela Bolsi um, in her keynote, who reminded us that to move forward, we also need to open the road behind, to open the roads behind, and also to find the commonalities in anti-colonial struggles that kind of um, have been um, that can lead the way towards finding um, kind of commonality in our goals and making sure that we, as, as has been pointed out before by several of us, make sure that we actually find inspiration in those movements, in those struggles and in each other and actually kind of embrace each other in the way that you were mentioning, Nadia, to make sure that we, uh, we actually um, ensure that these processes will be taken forward and will actually be taken forward, not because of, only because of certain individuals pushing them forward. Although I must congratulate you know, all of you who, who have been doing these um, quite difficult moments of having to find the strength to address these things in an institution that for a very long time has actually kept us out of the door, as you were mentioning also earlier. I think um, being the director of, 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 of a museum such as the Pitt Rivers Museum, which sort of wants to be a place that um, kind of bridges the town and the town, and, and to a certain degree does, because we do receive 440,000 visitors. Most of them actually say they have nothing to do with the university. If only 5% say that they are members of the university. Um, we can be that place where public education takes place and we receive about 30,000 children a year who do get you know, education. But several of our educational officers also said, it's so hard to talk about these aspects when they're in the curriculum. There's so little space actually, uh, which are being enabled for those conversations yes. to take place. And because even though the Pitt Rivers Museum, one could say, breeds colonialism because of certain cases that are there, such as the Berlin Bronzes case, such as the treatment of dead enemies case. Um, we very much also want to be the place that actually talks about the many ways of knowing and the many ways of being and the many ways of coping and about that common humanity. So how do we on the one hand enable those conversations to take place which are very much forward looking and at the same time face those mamas as you were talking about them, uh, which are the places where guilt and shame should actually be faced and talked about so that we open the roads behind to be able to look forward. And I think that's where um, we, are, we are trying to engage and, and very much conscious of, of intersectionality issues um, with many of the communities within the university and, and beyond, also grassroots movements uh, beyond, to see how do we enable telling of these histories of resistance, agencies of indigenous peoples, um, agency also finding, finding communities which have not been finding us because we actually are quite a, for some people, we are a very violent space to come to. Mm -hmm. The 440,000 visitors who visit us and who review us, they love us, they give us five stars and they kind of see us as the, you know, one of their favorite museums in all the world and their all time favorite museum. But there's also other people that actually do not find us a very hospital and welcoming space. And we want to be a space that's actually hospital to all of those peoples. So objects obviously and, 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 and um, uh, collections, they tell many, many stories. And they enable us to talk about certain of those paths which are actually very, very difficult to talk about. The Benin bronzes are some of the worst examples of what happened, I don't know how many people know about this, but this was in the 
late 1890s when a group of um, officials of um, the British Empire wanted to go to Benin City in Nigeria. Um, they were told not to go. They came anyways. They were killed and that's when a punitive campaign, military campaign, was organized to ransack Benin City, which was one of the biggest kingdoms uh, of Africa, obviously, at, the, at that time. Kill children and, and, and um, women and everybody who was there and bring all the bronzes and, and the objects that were there as loot to Britain. The British Museum then sold it to pay for the punitive campaigns to several museums across Europe, and those collections are now held in those museums. So there's, there's, there's elements in those collections that are such um, kind of sites of violence and a, and a continuation of violence if nothing is done to redress that situation. But also, there's other elements towards in, in those collections which actually speak of many, many different indigenous agencies and uh, agencies from all across the world that do speak about many, many different ways of knowing and being and actually different sorts of knowledge. So how do we ensure that we talk about all those different aspects, but also redress what needs redressing, such as you know two weeks ago where the Tupuna, which are the ancestors of the Maori, were able were enabled to go back. Seven of the of, of the Toimoko um, tattooed uh, heads of chiefs were enabled to go back in a repatriation because that's also certain aspects of what museums need to do. I'm going to stop there. But I um, I just wanted to say that we we very much want to ensure that the sort of visibility and voice that is needed for those alternative histories to be told and also for the more difficult parts. And I think that's where we can also find each other in seeing how do we enable those, um, on the one hand, to be voices and places where that teaching can take place and at the same time where do these critical voices find the space that they should be addressed. Thank you so much to all of our speakers.